Support for Family Trips comes from Fidelity. Your entire life you've been told to save and save and save, but has anyone helped you figure out how to spend? With Fidelity Income Planning, we'll help you create a clear, personalized plan for cash flow. One that includes your 401k and all your other accounts. However you want to work with us, either one-on-one or with our planning tools, we'll help you to build a withdrawal strategy for when you're not working. We can help you gain a better understanding of your options to help you make the right decisions to best fit your life ahead. Also, you can enjoy whatever comes next. And you can go from saving to living. Learn more at fidelity.com slash income planning. Advisory services provided by Fidelity Personal and Workplace Advisor, LLC, for a fee. Brokerage services by Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC. Hi, Pashi. Hi, Sufi. So this is very fitting to open this week's episode this way. You are currently by yourself skiing. (laughs) Yeah. Well, no, I'm going somewhere here. Now, you're by yourself skiing. You have a a few technical issues. If it feels a little different to anybody, that's because Josh is on a mountain, which are historically not the best places for Wi-Fi, right? Yeah. I mean, I will say before I even came up here, I called and I was like, you guys have very good Wi-Fi, right? Like, I don't, I can't even take this trip if you don't have good Wi-Fi. And they said, yes, we've got the whole mountain has Wi-Fi. Even on the mountain, you have Wi-Fi. And I was like, great. And came on up. Now, I think the difference here between you and I, and despite having the same childhood where we diverged, I know in my bones <laughs> that the people in the ski industry are liars. <laughs> They're liars and frauds. Here's what I'm getting at. So, You went skiing by yourself. Again, you love to ski. Love it. Love it so much. I do not care for it, but I'm really proud of my boys because while you were living it up on your West Coast skiing, it was a bitterly cold Northeastern weekend. And the dudes, my dudes had ski lessons Uh on Sunday. And it was one of those days where I just kept waiting for it like getting an email from the mountain saying, we can't do this to kids. We decided to shut down the ski school for the day. Right. And also my kids are really good at bitching and moaning, but I think they didn't know that it was even possible for it to be too cold for it to get canceled or else I think they would have used that as their, you know, line of complaint. Yeah, of course. It's a great line. You used to use it all the time when you were a kid. Absolutely. I wanted to use it here, but I knew, (laughs) I should also note, One of the reasons why I couldn't hit the eject button on this is Alexi was out of town. It couldn't be the first time my wife goes out of town and let my kids puss out because it's too cold to ski. Right, 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 right. Get them to ski school and classic dad who doesn't know jack shit about his kids' schedule or lives. (laughs) Ash and I go over to the general area of the ski school and there's a dude with a clipboard and I go over and I'm like, hey, yeah, my son Ash has got a ski I don't know what group he's in. And the dude looked at me, his heart broke because it meant he had to take his glove off again to flip the pages. Oh, yeah. And it was that yeah. kind of cold where even a ski professional was sad to take a glove off. Yeah. I know what that's like. It's awful. That hand doesn't get warm again as soon as you put it back in the glove. It could be a 15 minute process before you get back to 100%. Wind was whipping blowing his little clipboard paper around. And then he finds Ash and I go, all right. And Axel and I are so cold, we got a bolt. And I'm also not trying to show Ash, I'm dropping him off and I'm doing it fast because it's inhuman to be outside. So I'm like, all right, bye. And he's like, bye. I go back to the lodge. Axel's class starts half hour later. I get him. He also agrees to go. I can't believe it. And now I'm just waiting in the lodge for the announcement of, hey, if, if there's a, a Mr. Myers here. (laughs) Your kids are out. And (laughs) my dudes did it. Yeah. And there were kids coming in all day. They were making announcements and parents were going to sort of the foot of the lodge and coming back with kids. By the way, no parent was mad. No parent was like, well, you got to be tougher. Everybody accepted this was too much to ask of a kid. And then my boys came in And they just were great. And they both had a good time. That's great. Yeah. Were you just like sleeping in a corner of the lodge? No. I mean, here's what happened to me. A couple things. One, Alexi bought me new heated gloves, charged them all night. Very happy about it. Uh Uh-huh. You know, there's like a little on and off button and charged Uh them, plugged them in, and then uh, hit the button. Nothing happened. And a friend of mine was in the lodge and he said, have you Googled the uh, instructions on the glove? 
And I said, I got to think you hit the on button and they turn on. <laughs> it's a fair assumption. Like, I appreciate that, that we all want to dig in, but I think I got bum gloves. So that's one thing, the gloves. But I did feel very strongly that if my kids still wanted to ski, I wanted to be ski ready. So I was sitting in a lodge chatting with some people. And then about 15 minutes before Axel, I decided I'm going to go get ready to go. Put on my boots, get my skis. They're on the car. Yeah. Now, yeah. here's where I have to compliment you as a brother. You have known mm -hmm. historically, what's my least favorite part about skiing? Like the equipment, the boots probably? The boots. I think I have bad feet for ski boots. Yeah. And I have always really hated putting my boots on. You got me these really good. I went to a store. They took a measurement of my feet in foam. They come with yeah. heaters. Yeah, Surefoot. Not, I mean, not a, not a sponsor, but Surefoot. Well, they're not going to want to be a sponsor by the end of this. So oh, <laughs> maybe we'll even beep it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look, I want to stress, I don't think Surefoot's the problem here. I think it's my feet. Are yeah, the I'm still rocking my Surefoots, I'll say. Yes. So, and and by the way, the staff at Surefoot treated me very kindly. So it's all very positive, save for this fact. I go out, again, I've been heating my boots. I'm doing everything right. And I think it might be psychological. I feel like when I try to put my foot into a ski boot, my bones and my feet are made of the same material as a Fabergé egg. And <laughs> I just feel like my whole foot is going to break like a ice sculpture. Right. And I can't do it. It just, I, I, I freak out. Yeah. So I didn't put my boots on. And then I was driving the kids home and Ash was asking me if I was cold when I was skiing. And I sort of gave a lot of non-answers because I, I was too embarrassed. And finally I had to say, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't actually ski. I couldn't get my boots on. I got sad. <laughs> Uh, well, well, maybe we'll have a little lesson, a little boot on and off lesson next time I come out there. I would love a lesson. And then I should also say uh, the only thing they talk about the entire drive to skiing, is about half an hour, and the entire drive home, which is half an hour, is there's a place we stop to get hot cocoa at the end of it that also has an old school gumball machine. Uh-huh. And it's all they talk about is the gumball machine and how many pieces, <laughs> how many pieces do they get per coin? And is there any way to try to ask for certain colors? And it's just, you know, you know the kind of gum I'm talking about. It's the worst gum in the world. Garbage. Garbage gum. Garbage gum. And yeah. they talk about gum for so much. And I have reached this point, and I don't think any parenting book would tell you this is a good path forward where I say things like, I don't want to talk about gum anymore. Gum is boring. And I don't think that's. <laughs> <laughs> it, as a conversation piece, it, it is. You're, you're not wrong. But what Alexi would say, and again, I hope that at this point, all our listeners have picked up that she's better at being a parent. She would say, you, what you have to do is you have to like steer it to a new topic. Uh, you know, If they want to talk about gum, you can't just say, shut up. I don't want to talk about gum. Yeah. You have to say, what was your teacher's name? Who were in your class? And so that's what I have to, I'm trying to refocus myself to have better conversations as opposed to my kids, as opposed to just letting them choose a topic. And when I think it's boring, tell them to just be quiet. Yeah. I mean, I, in your defense, I will say, what's your teacher's name? To me, that's even more boring. Yeah. I'd rather talk about gum than yeah, like, who's true. in your class? Yawn. Yeah. Mackenzie recently bought a pack of Hubba Bubba. And she oh, wow. went upstairs or she went outside for like a minute and came back in. And our dog, Woody, <laughs> was chewing two pieces of hubba bubba. Great, great. He was all about it. Real distinct smell on that hubba bubba. Do you have an impulse buy, say, at a grocery store checkout where it is maybe a candy from your past, like hubba bubba, where you think, yeah, I'm going to get it? No, I mean, like, like in the old days, it would be a Snickers bar. And I was really, I was always a, a sucker for those uh, pizzeria pretzel combos. Oh, those are really good. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, every now and then, will just get a thing of orange Tic Tacs and eat the whole thing. Oh, yeah. I could see you doing that. Because also, you don't like leftovers. I don't. So you might as well eat them all at once. <laughs> it's also, you just eat, as a parent, you just start eating like a, the way a junkie shoots up, where you just... I don't want anybody to know I had the Tic Tacs. Right. It's a real leave no trace situation. Yeah. How was your uh, uh, skiing day alone? I hurt myself. No, really? I hurt myself again. God, I buried the lead. I put a pole into the ground. I was trying these new skis. 
and uh, my pole jammed into my rib. And uh, I don't even know if I can ski today. I got to figure it out. I'm going to go out on the mountain and give it a go. But also with my uh, Wi-Fi situation up here, uh, I think I have to get home tonight anyhow because we're recording again tomorrow. And I can't, uh, I can't trust this mountain. Plus, it hurt me again. There's no, almost no professional skiers or professional podcasters due to the Wi-Fi issue. Yeah. Although that's probably not. I bet a bunch of them have podcasts. Yeah. No, I'm sure they do. I mean, at this point, who, who doesn't? And I, I bet they don't get the kind of injury I just got. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jamming themselves in the rib with their own pole. I think the other thing about poles, I'm just going to say briefly, I forget my own poles every week. And so I have to I have to go rent poles. And the nice thing about the place where you rent poles, they're just like, just take the poles and just bring the poles back. It's really nice how little they value the poles. I don't even have to fill out paperwork. I love that mountain. I love that place where you guys ski. It's really, it's very friendly. You know, it, it it's not the biggest mountain in the world, but it's got a good vibe and a, and a decent lodge. I don't have much more to yeah. say about it than that, other than I just yeah. dawned on me that I have to go back next weekend and I got a little sad. But it's great. All right. We have our friend Mike Berbiglia on the podcast today. What a champ. He really is a champ. He's one of, I would say, one of our greatest living storytellers. And so we were very lucky to have him join us. Easily. Yeah. No exaggeration. That's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. That's You're right. I should have said no exaggeration. Yeah. We would defend that in court. I would take it to court. Yeah. I would say, give this man a yarn to spin, and he will spin it. Yeah. If you don't believe us, watch any of his specials. Yeah. He's good. All four of the Myers uh, across the board. Hillary and Larry, big fans as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should say real quick, you know, uh, the Poncas, mom and dad, were going to join us this weekend. Alexi was in out of town. My parents are going to come in and support our parents. Sorry. To take ownership. And dad got a chest cold and couldn't make it. And... Axel and Ash were super upset. Ash was upset in a sweet way of we miss you, and Axel was upset in a lousy way, which is you were giving me our Christmas presents, and how am I supposed to wait another day? <laughs> that kid loves presents. He does love presents. Yeah. Um, all right, so now we're going to be joined by our good friend Mike Berbiglia. But first, before that, here's our, another good friend of ours, Jeff Tweedy. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Oh, look at you. How are you? It's so on brand that you have <laughs> no card. <laughs> it's all I am. I'm I'm a full-time podcaster. I'm on a podcast 18 hours out of 24 hours in a day, Seth. <laughs> now, we've done, again, now that we're hosting podcasts, I've also dipped my toe in being a guest on a podcast. Oh, yeah. Do you feel so much better about being a guest now that you host one? Oh, yeah. It feels so much easier, right? Oh, yeah. I mean... I think one of the things I've learned about the whole thing is is to actually bring something. Oh, okay. I think so. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Bring something. And in this case, I got a lot of family memories. Great. That's great. I would have hoped. I had a lot of confidence <laughs> about this episode. Like, one, I find you one of the easiest people in the world to talk to. Two, oh. you're one of our nation's great storytellers. Oh, wow. Three, you uh, often share in very funny ways, personal history. I mean, if you if you eat shit on this. <laughs> yeah, no, no. No, this this could be the beginning of the end. Yeah. Do you do you think you might beat yourself up after this because you haven't prepared enough because you're oh my, so Oh my god, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to spend the rest of my day <laughs> feeling down and and that's going to be hard because you'll be doing a lot of podcasts the rest of the day as well. So you'll have right. to <laughs> compartmentalize how badly this one has gone. But Seth, what's funny about you doing this to me is that I think that you are, and maybe Josh can tell me if this is true or not, I find you to be an open book and then a closed book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think intermittently. I feel yeah. like you have like a an open book ver Seth Meyers version, and then you have a closed book Seth Meyers version. And it's a very good book. It's a very good book. It's a very good book. Yeah. Do you think he goes closed book where it's just like, 
oh, hey, and let me tell you this real quick. Like, is it a closed book that you get to <laughs> peek, peek under the cover and he'll still tell you because he knows you or? Well, I think the dichotomy of Seth is that he is simultaneously this like wild, like open-minded artist creative But then there's the other side of you, which is like, you're like an executive. You like produce your talk show and like you were head writer for SNL. These jobs are hard. (laughs) So you have to be a little bit intense. And so I think that's part of you. I do feel like SNL was very intense. But I do think when I started my own talk show, I realized that intensity was not particularly helpful. And most of my intensity now I reserve for when I'm writing my own material for stand up. Mm. I think anyone who is a stand up is by design, as evidenced by the entire wall of no cards behind you. You're sort of the CEO of your stand up, right? Yeah, it's true. And so that is the most executive because there's no help. By design, right? Yeah. I think, you know, the most fun stand-up is the stuff that is completely born of your own thought process. So I remember I was just telling someone this, the time that we were both on a plane. This counts as a trip, Josh. Josh gets real (laughs) picked. We were both on a plane, famously famously used for trips. And we were both going uh, to Seattle and we were both working. Oh, my God. You know what I mean? And I remember... I know this. Yeah, yeah. I, I forgot this happened, but yeah. I was just telling someone, I was about to start watching a movie on the plane. Mm-hmm. And I saw how much you were working. <laughs> <laughs> I worked the whole flight. No, but it is. It's like one of those stories where a, like a young basketball player signs with the Bulls and they're like, and then, you know, Jordan was the last to leave. And so I just canceled my dinner plans. And that's how I felt because I just remember I was like, oh, I'm not going to watch a movie. <laughs> Big <Bigley's laughs> over here writing circles around me. Uh, um, I also, this is also, uh, uh, it counts because it's family, Josh. But we were just talking before you jumped on. Last year, right around this time, Josh, uh, myself, and my mom uh, went to see Old Man in the Pool. And oh, yes. I also remember that Mike Schur, our good friend Mike Schur, was there. Mm-hmm. And I believe he had one of one, if not both of his kids with us. And I remember yeah. thinking this is right. Yeah, you had both kids and uh, his wife, JJ, was, was there. And I was like, oh, this is really speaks to uh, what I think is wonderful about you, which is um, you have people your generation, which are Mike and I. And then uh, you have our parents and our children. And yeah. that is a re- Really nice thing. And and has that been something you have re- recognized more lately? Or has that always been the sense that if you go to see one of your shows, there's an understanding that, like this really will uh, be nice for anyone in your family? It's funny because with this show, like my last special was called The New One. It was all about like having a child, even though I never wanted to have a child and and all the reasons why no one should have children and why I was right about that. And then ultimately why I was <laughs> wrong about that. And then in this show is really about life and death. And I think what happened is this show opened itself up incidentally to people like you're saying, like Mike Schur's kids who were like 12, 14, because it's just about being alive. Like it's just like this, the most relatable thing. And I think, I think that accidentally, I didn't mean for it to be like this kind of, you know, big tent comedy show where it's like, oh, we're going to, everybody's going to grasp this or, and they can watch it with their kids. But I think incidentally that's what it did i like a thing that it does and the special is the old man in the pool it's available to watch on netflix it has one of my favorite jokes you've ever done oh wow i think i told you after i saw it there's a joke about the bathroom scale sorry the just the scale in doctor's offices (laughs) yeah 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 i don't want to give it away but i will just say that it's a thing you do in your acts that i love they have this wonderful thread to them there's big ideas there's little ideas and then there's these really nice super stupid, silly bits that could work in a five minute set at a comedy club, like independent of anything else. That is, by the way, and I'm doing, I'm basically prepping my next tour right now, which is called Please Stop the Ride. And I'm prepping it at, like you're saying, at at the Comedy Cellar in New York, where I do five minute chunks of, of brand new stuff. And I try to essentially have the segments of what will end up being a long form like 70 minute show hold up in a comedy club atmosphere where people have no idea who you are they don't know what your tone is 
So they don't know what your voice is. They're not locked into what your narrative is, your character and all this stuff. And I want to be able to kill with those people because I feel like it's like that idea of like in a great movie, I'm trying to think of a movie I watched recently. Like I rewatched Heartburn recently, the Mike Nichols movie. Mm -hmm. And like, if you walk into a room when someone has heartburn on, like, it's just captivating. It's like Nicholson, it's Meryl Streep. It feels very real. You immediately know they're in a marriage. You know that it's challenging. (laughs) You do have to say, oh, it's heartburn. Because people are like, what is this movie? (laughs) (laughs) You have to say it's heartburn. (laughs) But But even then, like, I think the best movies can break apart into five minute increments. And actually, you could show them any five minutes, and it would still be quite good. I think the problem with a lot of movies is actually they don't pass that test. Right? Yeah, my uh, fiance and I have been like, we were packing and getting ready for something and started watching Lost in Translation. And then like, we had 20 minutes before we were going to bed and we're just watching it in chunks. And that movie is very much like that as well. It's just like any chunk is, oh, so satisfying. Lost in Translation is another one. You can watch any five minutes and it's just Bill and Scarlett, I know neither of them. I call them by their first names. <laughs> My friends, Bill and Scarlett. Your friends. When Billy and Scar on screen together, <laughs> it's fireworks. And um, no, th- it really is like, a, there's a degree to which when people roll camera on a very simple scenario and they play it super real, like those are great actors. It's just interesting to watch. Heartburn's the same thing. It's like, Nicholson and Meryl Streep just in a marriage. It's like, not that much is happening. It's very (laughs) incremental over the course of the movie. Even The Graduate, it's like, not that much happens. It's interesting to watch Justin Hoffman at that age kind of experience this kind of uh, figuring out what the hell is the rest of his life going to be. I bet a lot of classic movies have very short entries under their plots in Wikipedia. (laughs) Yes, totally. Two paragraphs because really not that much happened. Well, it's funny. Like, I always use this uh, Spielberg thing, which is like the best movies can be described in like 25 words. Like when someone's pitching him a movie, if it's 25 words, it's like it kind of has to be for him to be interested in it. And I always think about that in relation to movies. It's like, oh, yeah. I always think about that with my shows, The Old Man in the Pool. It's like, I mean, I haven't done this in a while, but it's like, it's about a guy who goes to the doctor and he fails the pulmonary test And it sends him down a spiral of reconsidering his own life, his own mortality, his relationships with everyone he loves. You're at 45 words. You're at 45 words. Yeah. It was 40. (laughs) After the edit, after the edit, it's going to cut down to 25 words. Okay. okay, Wait, you got to edit your answer for the podcast? (laughs) No, I'm going to put it in the notes. I'm going to put it. I'm going to send you an email. I'm going to put it in the notes. I'll have you read it back. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. No, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> I agree. No, it's hard. It's a hard, hard exercise. Yeah. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I'm filibustering. I'm filibustering from the, the, the main point, which is family trips. The main point was show business can be saved if we just show chunks of movies, right? That's yeah. the. I think that's you want, what you're, it is. you're starting a new streamer called Chunks. <laughs> <laughs> if it's just you, just turn it on, and it's just five minute chunks. One after the other. You know, it's another another simple one. Four weddings and a funeral. Yeah. It's Hugh Grant going to four weddings and a funeral. <laughs> yeah. 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 There you go. Well, the podcast is called Family Trips, guys. Yes. Oh, I knew it was coming. <laughs> well, yeah, you had to. I'm looking at my little recording box. We've been going for th- almost 14 minutes here. Yeah. No, no, um, I know. Yeah. But the, remember, yeah. I mentioned airplanes and I mentioned that our family went to see Mike's show. So I think that. It hasn't yeah. been completely barren 13 minutes. There have been well, a couple. the airplane was you guys going to work, so decidedly not a family trip. So but, anyhow, Mike, you are the youngest of four? Youngest of four, yep. So Gina, Patty, Joe, and me. And your parents were, your dad was a doctor, is a doctor? My dad was a doctor. My mom was a nurse. We grew up in Central Mass, which is a part of Massachusetts that I'm not, I'm not sure why it exists exactly, but it does, <laughs> and that's where I grew up. You know what? Massachusetts does not work like a great movie where all the chunks independently. (laughs) Our mother is from the coast. My fiance is from Western Mass. And uh, yeah, I don't know if we've ever stopped in the middle. I mean, that's a a bit of a humble brag, Josh. Well, just saying. I don't know if we've ever stopped in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Josh just established himself as a coastal elite, but just coastal elite. coasts of Massachusetts. <laughs> Massachusetts coastal elite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've done just the sides of Massachusetts. Yeah. I like the foothills of the Berkshires, and then I love Marblehead. What are the age gaps uh, with you, uh, the three, and yourself? My sister Gina w- is 11 years older than me, which means that she was kind of my mom also. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's got a little bit of a little house on the prairie kind of thing going on. Everyone kind of raising one another. Yeah, it was healthy. I mean, if it weren't, honestly, older siblings... I think are a super cool thing to have because they introduce you to cool stuff. Mm -hmm. So like when I was a kid in the 80s, I was listening to like Simon and Garfunkel and Michael Jackson and like the Beatles and like all this stuff that was just cool and interesting. I don't think I would have if my sisters weren't like in high school when I was like a little kid. So that was like yeah. a huge thing. But they used to also torture me, which is to say that like they like Michael Jackson in the 80s. I think Seth and I are the same age. I think maybe Josh and I are close to the same age. I'm 45. 47. Yeah, so I'm almost 50. I might be 50 by the time this this airs. <laughs> For real. <laughs> For real. Wow. Yeah, yeah true. It's weeks it's away. It's weeks away. Wow, wow. So you remember in the 80s, and there's no one bigger than Michael Jackson. Like, there's almost not a quantifiable. I mean, Taylor Swift is the closest we come to. Yeah, it would be really funny right now if I tried to put you on the wrong side of history, and I'm like, I don't. I think only <laughs> a lot of us. The radar was up. We knew something was off. No. Yeah, it was like you couldn't wrap your arms around how big a thing Michael Jackson was. Weird Al was a huge thing because he parodied Michael Jackson songs. Rami Youssef had the funniest joke about how big Michael Jackson was, which is people always go like, where were the parents with the kids? Where were the parents? And he's like, you got to understand, it wasn't 1990s Michael Jackson we're dealing with here. We're talking about (laughs) 1980s Michael Jackson. We're talking about LeBron now. Yeah. We're talking about if somebody's like, hey, we're going to have your kids over to LeBron's basketball court and we're just going to shoot some hoops, you'd be like, oh, LeBron? Yeah, absolutely. Well, because part of it, too, is LeBron wouldn't risk everything. No! (laughs) Come on! (laughs) LeBron! We all know LeBron! Here's how big he is. And tell me if this rings true for you, Mike. My first thought when I hear Pepsi is that his hair caught on fire doing that Pepsi commercial. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think of it all the time. His hair caught on fire. Yeah. Do you remember this from childhood in the 80s? There was a prominent rumor that Michael Jackson and his sister Janet Jackson were the same person. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah. There was a big, like, you'd talk to people, or I would talk to people at school, and they would go, have you ever seen them together? And I would just go, I guess not. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny to think how much better life would be uh, for Michael, may rest in peace, if that rumor had been the true one. <laughs> He might well, he would, he effectively would be for that since Janet is. It would be Hitchcockian. Right. Hitchcockian would be a, such a better outcome for how people talk about. <laughs> uh oh. I can see in Josh's uh, eyes, we're not talking about family. Okay. Kids. Okay. No, okay. we're not. I mean, so, look, okay. So, so what, here's what I'll say about the. We, the this episode is going to be called Family Trips colon a reflection on michael jackson <laughs> there, okay so the reason why i bring up michael jackson is that my when my sister's friends would come over they would say to me mike and i was like six and they were like mike how does michael jackson dance oh perfect and i would go full michael jackson great yeah. I'm not exaggerating. I'd do 35 to 40 minutes of michael jackson dancing <laughs> they would laugh the entire time It was not a joke. I was not seeking laughter. Yeah. Well, you don't have, at six, you don't have control of your body. (laughs) And a six-year-old dancing is never going to look like, oh, those are like, those are sharp skills that have been honed. You're like Gumby, but looser. I also want to stress, though, I'm not sitting here thinking, by the time Mike was 12, you couldn't tell. (laughs) (laughs) Who's limbs of a six-year-old were the least of Birbiglia's problems when he was doing Michael Jackson. I had turned a corner by 12, and I was touring the country as a Michael Jackson impersonator. Right. 
Well, you're touring uh, Central Mass, which was, <laughs> was actually perfectly fine. It was the standard was there. Hey, so I uh, talk about that okay. older sister thing, because I do remember going over to friends houses who had older sisters and that desperate attention. There was nothing sexualized about it. It was just the idea of older girls actually being interested enough to pay attention to you. Do you feel like you had that your whole life or did you get used to it because you had two in your own home? I think that when you have a dinner table of six people and you're this small and you're trying to connect with people who are full-size, full-grown people, I feel like I just learned to be... A, it makes you a storyteller. It's like you have to have a refined story quickly to get people's attention. And I think that that's sort of how it ended up being. Like, I... I remember there was one time when I was really young where I was in the kitchen and I think I was trying to get everyone's attention. I stood up on a high chair. I stood up on it and I was like, hey, I have something to say. And I literally, the high chair went over, <laughs> landed on my head and everyone's like, he's fine. <laughs> so like an hour later, my mom is putting me to bed and she's rubbing her hands through my head and she takes out her hand and there's blood on her hand. And she's like, okay, let's have my dad take a look at this. They take a look at my head. There's a big hole in my head. They rushed me to the hospital. I ended up with like 20 stitches oh my. in my head. And that's how I ended up being a comedian. <laughs> it's a cliche. People go like, oh, you're a comedian. Would you fall on your head? I'm like, yeah, I actually did. Yeah. yeah. But also you were a little bit of a comedian beforehand. And you were like, even before that, I was trying to get their attention. So I had half of it. <laughs> Hey, we're going to take a quick break and hear from some of our sponsors. Support for family trips comes from OneSkin. You guys, the holidays are over. It's time for us to take a long look in the mirror and see what we can do to improve ourselves as we head into 2024. And OneSkin makes it easy with their science-backed approach to healthier skin. You are a big believer in science-backed approaches, Josh. I've always trusted science. I trust the science. Well, guess what? There's a scientifically proven peptide called OS1 in one skin. It targets fine lines and wrinkles right where they start your cells. And let me just say something about my cells, Josh. Mm -hmm. Posh. Yeah. Peptide. Peptide might be a good new nickname for you I might use. <laughs> let me tell you something, <laughs> Peptide. I just turned 50. My cells are feeling every second of those first 50 years. This is the time for me to get a little OS1 on the old face, my wife passive aggressively for my 50th birthday gave me a big old box of one skin and I heard her loud and clear. One skin simplifies your face care process. As Peptide likes to say, keep it simple. <laughs> one skin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, one skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using code TRIPS at oneskin.com. Co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with code TRIPS. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you New Year Healthier Skin. That's OneSkin. Support for family trips comes from Fidelity. If you're like me, you're not looking to work forever, so that means you need to start planning for retirement, which might seem daunting. But with Fidelity, it's easy to start planning for retirement. Fidelity helps you envision your future while focusing on both your short and long-term goals. Fidelity will help you look at your full financial picture and help you create a plan to save effectively. A plan that helps you balance risk and reward based on your comfort level. And once you have the actionable steps that will help you get to the future, you can stress less about it and enjoy more of life right now. It's what Fidelity calls the planning effect. And you can learn more about it at fidelity.com slash planning effect. Investment involves risk, including risk of loss. Advisory services provided by Fidelity Personal and Workplace Advisors, LLC, for a fee. Brokerage services by Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC. I like, by the way, that both of your parents are uh, in the medical uh, field. And I would guess that they never say when they're teaching how to be a nurse or a doctor, if your kid falls, wait an hour before. <laughs> you wait an hour. It's the wait an hour rule. It's the wait, wait an, an hour. hour. Did you always eat at the table? Did the six of you always eat dinner around a table? Yeah. Although it's funny because it was a different time. <laughs> it was, it was, I've been doing this joke lately on stage where I go, 
I go, my daughter's eight years old and, and, uh, which is amazing. But when, you know, I know when she's 15, she's just going to be like, my dad is garbage, you know, and I'm fine with that, but I'm resentful of my dad because he didn't have to deal with that. Like we said it, but it was the eighties. Nobody listened to children. You know, yeah. he, I'd be like, my dad's garbage. He'd be like, is someone talking? You know what I mean? And I'd be like, am I talking? And then, you know, and that's how I became a comedian. But like now in modern times, it's like we really listen to children, which is great. But so when she's 15, she's going to be like, my dad is garbage. And I'm going to be like, she's so brave. How can I amplify her voice? How can I yeah. support her platform? I think about that all the time about like how different my relationship is with my daughter and my dad's relationship with me and 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 my brother and sisters. It's just, it's worlds different. He just wasn't, to answer Josh's question, like, did you go, were you guys around the dinner table like that? I mean, not that often. Like, my dad didn't come home until, like, he, like, left early, home after bed a lot of times. Like, I just didn't see him, like, all that much. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm literally now... As an adult, like going, you know, it's like I'm going to tennis with Una. I'm going to gymnastics and ballet. And I'm like, wow, my parents really didn't go to my things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, part of it is that New York City thing where just so much more time intensive to get your kids to something. And then once you get them there, I feel like if it was the suburbs, I might drop them off and like go do something for an hour. But in New York I'm like, ah, oh. you know, I'm just so tired from like getting them to gymnastics. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to sit in this hot lobby. <laughs> My kids do not begin what is going to be a gymnastics career. Yeah. How often do you think dad was home for us, Josh? Because in my head, he was home all the time. But the reality was he probably wasn't. It just felt like he was home all the time because he his personality was such that he just felt like he was around in a good way. Yeah. Well, I mean, he would get home from work and right away he would say, come upstairs uh, like he'd get out of his, you know, I'm a businessman. He'd get out of those clothes and get into something more comfortable. And we'd go up and like hang out on the bed when he was getting changed. And then we would always have dinner together. That's how I feel. And then, right? and then he was around on the weekends, not rubbing it in here for bigs. If somebody <laughs> uh, you know, somebody burst a, an appendix on an airplane, he'd be useless. Whereas your dad. If my parents had only been to the North Shore of Massachusetts in Western Mass and had never gone to Central mm -hmm. Mass, like I imagine that that's that would have been their experience as well. Yeah. yeah. This is a true story. Our dad commuted to uh, to Boston every day. Oh. Hour drive both ways. And we were like, is that commute bad? And he goes, you know, it's not bad at all because all I ever think is, thank God I'm not driving to Central Massachusetts. Oh my God. I don't think I've never had an opinion about Central Massachusetts <laughs> until Mike brought it up. I want to let our listeners know if you're from Central Mass. This is all based on what Mike said earlier. Oh I never gosh. thought. Of it. And he's from there. He spent time there. And I love it. I love it. I love I love, honestly, I love that it was quiet. I would spend hours like with my friends, like in the woods. And yeah. yes, by the way, I think Southern New Hampshire is the central mass of New Hampshire. It's like not the sort of mountainous postcard part of New Hampshire. And it was the same thing. It was quiet and we had woods and it was safe and it was great. Yeah. It's not the lakes region. It's not where you go skiing. It's not the beach, but it's, yeah, it's got woods. My daughter said to me literally the other day, she goes, Dad, are there still woods? <laughs> I explained that there weren't and that the world yeah. has changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A different time. You grew up. <laughs> you you'd just go in the woods, talk about Michael Jackson. We thought none of this. <laughs> we practiced the moonwalk on. On fresh pine cone. Let me be direct on this. Did you ever take a family vacation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> here he comes. Yeah. So my dad had it in his mind that we were going to be a skiing family. Gotcha. And so we would take like annual trips to like Vermont. And it would be that thing where we put all the stuff on the roof of the car. Like everything. You have a station wagon and then you put a ton of skis and equipment on the roof of the car and i remember one year where my dad i always say about my dad that he's when i was a kid he'd get mad but we weren't even sure why he'd be mad he'd be like god damn it i'm eating pretzels you know we'd be like is he angry is he hungry like what is the emotion <laughs> being expressed and so when something real happened it was colossal 
and the 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 realness one year when I was very young was uh he couldn't get the rack onto the car that held the skis and the equipment. And he was just like, the goddamn rack won't go on the car. And then finally he said, uh, he said, we're not going. And then we all just kind of sat around for like a couple hours at the house and we're like, I guess we're not going to have Christmas. And then <laughs> I think my brother Joe, which is very much Joe's role in the family, I think he figured out how to get the rack on the or you know what I think he might have done he might have just used those co- the bungee cords to strap everything to the to the top of the car but then we did we, you know we did ultimately go skiing on this trip to Vermont I want to say Stow Vermont which is where the Von Trapp family from the sound of music had a lodge or maybe they still have a lodge in in Stow Vermont wow you remember that the, the Von Trapp family singers yeah but the re- the real von traps yeah 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 i mean at this point it's, at this point it's like grandchildren or whatever but it's like yeah yeah they they have like a von trap family lodge in in vermont huh? wow sounds lovely two things about the story one very much in line with what would happen with larry myers if larry our dad said i just yeah. got to go on top of the car i would not think we're in the clear <laughs> <laughs> I will also say that if my dad came in and said the ski trips canceled, the next time I met a genie, I would only need two wishes because I would be so happy about the ski trip being canceled. (laughs) I already got one. I'm good. That would be the dream for me. Okay. There's a few key details about this story. One is that on the drive home from Vermont, there was a big snowstorm. And you know, coming back from Vermont, you know, weather can be terrible in the winter. And it was rigorous and it was through mountains and all this kind of stuff. And this is, I think, a, a demonstration of how childhood memory works. When we arrived home after this rigorous drive, there was a Boston Globe newspaper article and it had a big graphic of a family driving through the mountains in the snow and there was a wolf. There's a wolf in the, in the drawing. And my siblings told me, this is very uh, akin to how they would treat me, across the board. They told me that that picture in the newspaper was of us. And I believed that it was of us. I had no grasp of the idea of that would be actually <laughs> fundamentally impossible. That there a photograph would have been taken while we were driving moments ago. And then someone did develop the photo and then they published it in the newspaper that had arrived by the time we arrived at home. For years, people would ask me, you know, have you ever had a wild thing in the mountains or a trip or whatever? And I would say, oh, wildest thing happened. We were driving home on this trip and we saw a wolf. It was snowing and we saw a wolf and we got home and there was a picture of us (laughs) driving with the wolf. And I would tell people this confidently. I would say this absolutely happened. And everyone I spoke to would think to themselves and not say, there's no way that happened. That makes no sense. And that's how my career began. Yeah, that that's how good of a storyteller you are. That <laughs> they would blind them to the impossibility <laughs> of the result. Hey, we're going to take a quick break and hear from some of our sponsors. Support for Family Trips comes from HelloFresh. Hey, Bashi. Yes, Ufi. Why don't you talk a little about HelloFresh? Well, HelloFresh, they send you these meal kits. Yeah. And they're in these little paper bags... And you open them up and they're filled with like the most beautiful ingredients. And then it comes with the recipe on how you're supposed to prepare it. So you might have to chop some vegetables, which I got no problem doing. And then you make this meal and it's more interesting than sort of the regular humdrum, dare I say, meals that I typically make for myself. And then I think it makes you a better cook. It gives you something more unique than your everyday. First of all, thank you for your bravery and daring to say humdrum. Also, (laughs) you don't get bored either. There is now uh, 45 dinner options to choose from weekly. Even more market add-on items that suit any lifestyle. Josh, what do you think is the most important meal of the day? I mean, I know people like to say breakfast. That's the classic, isn't it? Well, guess what? HelloFresh agrees. In fact, they're giving all subscribers free breakfast for life. That means you'll enjoy a totally free breakfast item with every single HelloFresh delivery 
Now that's worth waking up early for. Go to HelloFresh.com slash trips free and use code trips free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash trips free with code trips free. America's number one meal kit. This episode is brought to you by U.S. Bank. I'm a foodie to the core. Whether it's in the kitchen, trying out a new recipe, and then having my wife come into that same kitchen and say, get out of the kitchen, you're doing it wrong. (laughs) Or going to a new restaurant. And now whether I'm eating out or eating in, I can earn rewards with the U.S. Bank Altitude Go Visa Signature Card. Hey, Pashi. Yes, Sufi. Spent the holidays in New Mexico, where my wife is from. You've been there. You've come every once in a while. Beautiful. And one of the best eating parts of the country that I was never aware of until I met Alexi, Southwestern cuisine, green chilies, red chilies. What do they call it when you order them both together? You know what it's called? It's called Christmas. Wow. And we're not just making that up. You can say Christmas all year round and they know that that's red and green together. You know what the best part is? What's that? Got to use my U.S. Bank Altitude Go Visa signature card. And if you do the same thing, You'll earn four times points when you go out for dining or order takeout and restaurant delivery, plus earn two times points when you shop for or order your groceries. Think of all the rewards you will earn every time you make your favorite meal or order from your favorite restaurant. The Altitude Go card also earns two times points at gas stations and EV charging stations, as well as on streaming services. Plus, discover how you can earn 20,000 bonus points, a $200 value at usbank.com slash Altitude Go when you apply. Live every day your way with the Altitude Go card. Learn more at usbank.com slash Altitude Go. Limited time offer. The creditor and issuer of this card is U.S. Bank National Association, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Incorporated. Some restrictions may apply. What was the Berbiglia family ride? A family of six, what were you driving? I want to say we had, it was always station wagons. At one point, we had an Oldsmobile. I think at one point, there was a Peugeot in the mix. I don't even know if that's a car company anymore. Yeah, I um, know. It might be. They're not a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of, this was a fascinating like, car thing. At one point, I think my dad went through a midlife crisis and bought, you remember this car? A Buick Riviera. Mm. I mean, the name rings a bell, but I can't visualize it. Just the name, though. Just the name. But it doesn't. Like, midlife crisis to me is like a Trans Am or a Mazda Miata. Like, if he must. that seems like the most reasonable midlife crisis car. No, no. Look at it. Look at it. <laughs> look, at the, look at the Buick Riviera. It says luxury car when you Google it. It looks a little, like, gangstery. <laughs> yes. So the Buick Riviera. And uh, so there was a hurricane that was coming Wow. In, in the, isn't the, is the 1980s, I think. Hurricane Gloria? Yeah, it was Hurricane Gloria. And Hurricane Gloria was on its way. And I decided I'm going to stay outside for this one. Told my family, I'm going to be on the front porch. I'm just going to see this through. And I, once again, completely ignored. I went out on the front porch and I sat on the front porch of our house on Westwood Road in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts and watched the storm. It was actually quite epic. And at a certain point, it got, the winds got so extreme that uh, <laughs> that they were like, I think you have to come inside. I think this is getting dangerous. So I go inside. You would have toughed it out? No, no, I would have toughed it out. Great. Well, you know you know me. I'm no, all yeah. in on hurricanes. <laughs> well, look, storm, <laughs> and it will blink first. If I had my druthers, I would be a CNN weather correspondent in Florida. A storm chaser. You love- I'd be a storm chaser. Chase too. <laughs> so I go inside and I, I look out the front window and there's an oak tree in our front yard. It's huge. And I see it topple over like in slow motion, full topple, lands dead center in front of, in, in the middle of the Buick Riviera. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> 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 it was so satisfying. I bet. It was so satisfying. A lot of like car insurance, they you get covered for acts of God. And acts of God. And that's it was considered like, an it was act of perfect, God. It was like a Coen Brothers movie version yeah. of my life. Especially the midlife crisis car having a tree fall on it is Yes. Really- it couldn't be more perfect. Some guy who feels like cock on the wall for a week in his new Buick Riviera and then 
smash. <laughs> We've established 11 years older for your older sister. And then how close is uh, is Joe? So then my sister Patty's a few years younger than that. And then my brother Joe is a few younger years younger than that. So Joe is like five years older than me. I actually have this memory when I was a kid that Joe and I were talking about the other day because Joe writes with me and he produces a lot of, of the shows that I do and everything. We've worked together for well, you know, almost 20 years. And the other day I go, Joe, do you remember when you were, when Joe, like Joe was in college, I was in, I don't know, Joe was maybe 18, I was maybe 13. And I found out that Joe had smoked pot. And I was like, shocked by this. I mean, it was full. I mean, I had gone to the D.A.R.E. program, if you remember that, D.A.R.E. kids to not use drugs, which was always confusing. It's like, we dare you not to use drugs. We're like, wait, to use them or not? Use, to not, to not use them, you know? I like that adults at the time thought, you know what kids are really susceptible to is uh, dares. <laughs> <laughs> we were yeah 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 you could dare yeah, exactly. me to do anything yeah, yeah. we were as, as kids we were just like but we you know you've we've been told by grown-ups that we shouldn't do stuff if you dare us to they're like it's an acronym we're like we don't know what an acronym is you know <laughs> so so i was very trained do we remember what the acronym stands for just to oh, prove yeah. drug abuse resistance education well done ah smooth yeah Real quick, dad said recently, he's like, oh, they opened a recreation equipment store in Bedford. I was like, what's that? He's like, it's REI. I was like, yeah, who calls it recreation equipment? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, bro? I don't even know that good for. I didn't either. I was like, well, I don't know what that is. He's like, it's REI. I was like, oh, okay, call it REI. All right. And, then, by the, and Josh, by the way, news to me. Yeah. REI, no idea what the acronym stands for. Also, he never said what the I was. So Joe had smoked pot. I don't know. Maybe he was 20. I don't know how. He was in college. Uh, and this was a loss of innocence for me. And I go, Joe, what are you doing? Like, you're throwing away your life. Mm. I was like a kid. And he goes, Mike, do you think dad has ever smoked pot? And I was like, I don't know. And he was just like knowingly like, like nodding, you know. And I tell this story to Joe recently because I thought maybe it would be funny to put it on stage. Joe goes, he actually never has. <laughs> the reveal on the story is that our dad has never smoked pot ever. I just like that Joe was like, I'm gonna get you stop, I'm gonna get you to stop thinking about me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a redirect. We had one of the first time my parents left us alone. Our parents left us alone. I remember I had a friend come over with like three beers and two wine coolers. Yeah. I was probably, I'm gonna say 17 or 18. Okay. And there was no risk of anybody getting inebriated. The idea was like, let's all try a beer. It was that level. <laughs> Josh, who is only two years younger than me, so he's either 16 or 15, goes berserk at the very idea that his older brother is going to drink a beer. Furious about it. Just uh, windmill punches. Yeah. I remember he had to be physically restrained. Wow. Crying. Josh, to his credit, never had any shame about totally melting down emotionally in front of older kids. <laughs> Nobody dared me not to cry. Josh, can we can we unpack your resistance there? I mean, it's the same thing. It's it's like uh, Nancy Reagan had us all hooked. I know, like, you know, we've had Reggie Watts on the podcast. He wrote a play about not doing drugs. I know you wrote a rap about yep. not doing yep. drugs like yeah that's right it was everywhere like that sort of mindset of it, it was the this is your brain on drugs era yeah. with those with those eggs and so i was afraid and uh so yeah i just i loved my brother and seth wants to make fun of how much i loved him so seth why don't you continue I'm going to say everybody also it was a uh, very clear at the time that bartles and james was a gateway to heroin <laughs> oh my god <laughs> those guys uh half a wine and then you know who knew where it would last but it is true and i think when you go back to how the the monoculture we grew up in yeah is that you watch television and then there was like this seven year period where every other commercial break would either have a, a you know a mad mothers against drunk driving there were a lot of commercials with like a beer and then yeah. 
of screeching tires and breaking glass and yes. and the red police car lights on the screen. And so that we were, I think those statistics were being thrown That's a great deal. So this is a this is a story that isn't a it's a trip that my parents took. But uh, Josh, which, will you will you yeah, allow it? At least it's a trip. I mean, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, the other one was a trip. The, no, I know. I'm just a trip. Well, I feel like we've sort of scratched the surface. We got once you went to uh, Vermont, and yeah. then after that, yeah, no, nowhere, nowhere. Okay, so. okay. <laughs> How about this? How about this? Great. My parents went on a trip when my my older sisters were in high school. I was maybe six or seven. Joe was maybe twelve. It's the eighties. My sisters decide they're going to have a house party at our house while my parents are gone and not tell them. First of all. What universe is it? I mean, it's like an 80s movie. I mean, it's like risky business or something. Like, what parents are like, we're going to go away for a week. We're going to leave our teenage daughters with our house for a week? Like, I don't understand the blind. I don't know. Like, the there's a certain degree of like, how could you possibly have missed this, right? My sister's very smart move. They send me and my brother over to our respective best friends' houses for the night. I went to Michael Cavanaugh's house for a sleepover. Joe went to Mike Flynn's house for a sleepover. By the way, no questions asked from those parents. My sisters, my teenage sisters, sent their younger brothers <laughs> to a sleepover? like For your own protection. Right, like, by the way, uninvited it's not like they invited us yeah they literally called my parents friends and we're just like so we'd like mike to come over they're teenagers we're basically telemarketers <laughs> <laughs> an incredible opportunity so gina and patty have a party that is full 80s movie party you know not only is it like hundreds of people in a very medium, small size home? There's apparently there were teachers there from the school. Wow. To party? Josh, <laughs> I hate I hate to burst your bubble, but the, in the 80s, there were parties where <laughs> teachers <laughs> went to high school parties. <laughs> it literally makes no sense to me at all. Career ending. It was, oh my God! This is this is Central Mass for you, man. Everything that happened <laughs> every day in Central Mass in the 1980s would end someone's career every day in modern times. <laughs> it's like international watch now. Anything goes. Yes. So they have this party. Teachers show up. Kids show up. They hire a bartender. Mm. So there's a bartender. The next day. I come home to our house and there are people asleep up the staircase. Amazing. Yeah. They're asleep up the staircase. I'm stepping through people. And there's tire marks all over our lawn. Fully like people have parked all over the lawn. They parked up the they down Beaver Drive, up Westwood Road. They parked both ways and all over our lawn. There is no way my parents will not find out there was a party. And then it snowed. Ah, wow. Full blizzard, foot of snow, covers all the tire tracks. My parents never found out. A few years later, my mom went for a walk with our neighbor, Mrs. Saliba, who she goes on, she used to go on walks with when I was growing up. Mrs. Saliba just says to my mom, she goes, hey, remember that party that your daughters had a few years ago where it was like a thousand people at your house and people were parked on your lawn? And my mom just goes, no. And then they never <laughs> talked about it again. The best. <laughs> Can't believe how the acts of God just kept breaking against your dad. <laughs> Do you think he would have brought down the hammer? Would your sisters have gotten in like crazy trouble or would it have been like, oh, come on, girls? When they were in high school, they were in trouble all the time. I mean, gotcha. they were grounded 
all the time. <laughs> like I like I can't, I don't remember a moment in high school where my <laughs> sisters weren't either being yelled at or just like leaving for a few days. It was like always dramatic. <laughs> they were there was a time where my mom got so mad at my sisters that they hadn't done their laundry. I mean, this is bananas. And if you knew my mom, you'd be like, that's insane. Cause she's, she's like one of the more, the kindest, most even keel, thoughtful people I've ever encountered in my life. I have a memory from my childhood where my mom is taking laundry from my sister's rooms, like dirty laundry and putting it in a sewer across the street. I'm not kidding. <laughs> a sewer. <laughs> and my sister's, my sister, Gina and Patty, enlisted me to run the reverse pattern and take the clothes from the sewer back to their bedroom. So I was like working for my sisters, trying to restore order in the laundry ecosystem. Very similar move from Larry Myers was, I remember, because our mom had a very gentle touch, a very ineffective gentle touch of trying to... <laughs> I was always in trouble and I was always getting grounded, but getting grounded for me was perfectly fine. Ultimately, what I wanted to be doing was be in my room reading. Yeah. It was never that bad. That was the problem. The punishment uh, was always fine. But my dad, I remember, uh, would just go in my room and every he said, everything on the floor is going into a garbage bag. <laughs> bag up my clothes and just take it away. And he's like, when you are ready to stop treating it like garbage, you can have it back. What happened to this tactic? This is a parental tactic that was is vestigial to the 1980s of children's things go in the just the garbage if you don't treat them well. The you know what it is is that they just my kids I definitely have my dad's temper, I have my dad's instincts, but ultimately my kids know I don't have the backbone to see it through. Oh. <laughs> so I'm like I'm going to throw this all away. They look at me like, "No, you're not." Throw we'll it try out. it. I'd say try it. Throw something away. I remember two things. One, just talking about 80s movies and parties. I remember once being at a house party. I wasn't here for this, and it might be apocryphal, but cops would come into houses, and kids would either run into the woods or hide in the house. Wait, wait. Cops would bust up a party. And in where we grew up, like if cops showed up, kids yeah. would off into the woods. Like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thing is sometimes kids would just try to hide in the house until the cops left. Yes. And I remember once uh, hearing a story that one of our friends was hiding in the bathtub and a cop pulled open the shower curtain and then said into his uh, radio, you know, rub-a-dub-dub, I got one in the tub. Oh Which... <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, uh, the first time our parents left us alone. I hope I haven't told this story about the mail. Josh, have I told the mail story? I don't think so. We had people over. It wasn't a party, but we had like sort of a unlicensed sleepover. And because we had told un under no, uh, un uh, you know, uncertain terms, were we allowed to have people over? And we did a really fast cleanup before my parents got back. And I guess one of my friends had taken all the mail and just put it under a couch cushion. Yeah. So my parents came home for a week away and they were like, where's the mail? Yeah. And we didn't get any mail. And my dad said, you're telling me for the first, <laughs> we got no mail. My capacity, and I got a kid now, my middle one, Axel, is this kind of liar who could just look you dead in the eye and say, yeah, we didn't get any mail. Yeah. And <laughs> then, you know, I think a weeks later, if somebody sat on a cushion, an adult, and, and realized there was a big lumpy pile of mail... And I remember, because I would get, as I said, grounded all the time, my dad would say, so you're grounded, and the thing I got to figure out is for how long. <laughs> I want you to know you're definitely grounded. I performed in Buffalo, New York recently, which is where my grandparents live. I lived when I was growing up. And what I explained to the audience at the beginning of the show is, when I was a kid, my understanding of the world was that there were two locations in the world. And there, it was Shrewsbury, Massachusetts and Buffalo, New York. And as I understood it, that was the entire world until I was about 10 years old. And then after that, my life got a lot better. Honestly, that's a lot of it. It's like, it's like we didn't go anywhere. Like, I, like we would go to my grandparents' house. Like, and I would be, and this is very Seth in a certain way. Like you're saying like you would just be like reading books in, in your bedroom. My grandmother was obsessed with this. Grandma Mackenzie was the Irish side of my family. 
she was obsessed with the fact that when I was in their house, they had like a little house in Hamburg, New York, outside of, of Buffalo. And I didn't have a room to be in. There was no room. There's no bedroom for me or whatever. So I took a closet that they had that had like a couple of steps in it. And I made the closet into a room for me. And so I lived in the closet for like a week. And yeah, and I would read books and I would draw pictures and I'd write poems and all that kind of stuff. And that that was sort of my claim to fame in the family is that I, I'm almost like a little like burrowing animal. I was just, I always <laughs> find a little spot to do my thing. That's great. I hope I little dad as he's saying you know tell us more about your trips and the reality is the only one you had was writing poems in a closet <laughs> <laughs> i feel like we may we almost missed that and i think that's a great that's a great uh. detail and that's uh yeah i used to i mean i spent some time like in closets and little spaces and uh yeah i mean i will say a couple steps in a closet a kid's gonna burrow on in there I mean, that's like, <laughs> yeah, that sounds like it has like a little door or like a smaller than regular door. All right. We have some questions that we ask all our guests, but I do. I, I want to say exactly what I thought. You were the easiest person to talk to. This is so lovely. Oh, great. Agree. I, 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 Agree. <clears throat> okay, great. And now Josh is going to ask you some questions. Okay. You can only pick one of these. Is your ideal vacation relaxing, adventurous, or educational? Ad adventurous, although I feel like everyone in my life would challenge me on that. <laughs> We're going to keep them off the podcast. Okay. Yeah. Great. What is your favorite means of transportation? Train, plane, automobile, boat, bike, your own two feet? I'm obsessed with trains and the subway. My grandfather, I say this in the old man in the pool, but my, my, my grandfather worked in the subway tunnels of New York City. Wow. He was an electrician. So they would blow up dynamite in these tunnels. And then the electricians would be the first ones who go in. They actually sh showed this at the MTA Museum down the street here in Brooklyn. The electricians would go in. It was very, it was very dangerous, pitch dark. And, you know, and they would light up these, these tunnels. And then I, and I, and I, the joke I say in the special, you know, after that, he worked at like a deli in Brooklyn called Joe's Luncheonette. And supposedly one day, one of his regular customers came in and said, how's it going, Joe? And he just keeled over in the counter killed over the counter and died um which is sad but in a way it's a pretty funny response if you think about it in some ways he was the original comedian of the family that is an extraordinary level of commitment <laughs> but i feel i feel very close to the sub the new york subway system i feel very i love taking it it's my fate because it's so damn effective i it's know it's the dirty etc but it's like it's amazing yeah. People that won't ride the subway, it drives me crazy when I'm in New York because it is the most efficient, fastest way to do it. And it's like, yeah, it's a little dirty, but it is so efficient. And yeah, I love it. Do you think, Mike, real quick, that your grandfather knew it was coming and he, he was like, I, if I can just hold off, I work at a luncheonette, <laughs> if I can just hold off till someone asks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look, I want to believe these things. This is... <laughs> I'm going to let you believe that one. There's things that we want to believe, and that's one of them. All right. If you could take a vacation with any family, alive or dead, fictional or real, other than your own family, what family would you like to vacation with? I once heard a, tr a story that I don't know if it's true or not, which is that sometimes Bob Dylan will go to Minnesota, and he's like the grandfather of like this family, like doing their like Christmases and Thanksgivings. And that he's just like Grandpa Bob. And I want to go to that. I want to go to that trip. I want to go there. Great call. <laughs> I love that. All right. If you had to be stranded on a desert island with one member of your family, who would it be? It is. I mean, my daughter, Una, is a riot. Great. Great. Here's the thing she said the other day. She goes, you know, the social dynamics at school are so intense. She goes like, I'll make up names. But she's like, you know. Sarah doesn't want me to be friends with Zoe. She only wants me to be friends with, with Sarah. And I'm like, Sarah doesn't get to decide who you're friends with. And Una goes, <laughs> and I was like, I know what you mean. Yeah. It was the first time I feel like we really understood each other. <laughs> she just goes, <laughs> like completely dismissing the idea with no argument whatsoever. Just like you couldn't <laughs> possibly understand third grade. Yeah. I'll let Sarah know. <laughs>
That'll go great. <laughs> and Shrewsbury, is Shrewsbury the official hometown? Shrewsbury is my hometown. My parents okay. have since moved to a couple different places, but but yeah, Shrewsbury. All right. Now, would you recommend Shrewsbury as a vacation destination? Look, there's four pizzerias and a church. I don't know what else there is, but the, I stand by those being good pizza. That's a very unpopular Hugh Grant movie. <laughs> <laughs> four pizzerias and a church. <laughs> well, you know, the problem with that movie, Seth, not a lot of plot. No, that's the problem. You can explain. It's what the weird thing, the problem where it fits the Spielberg rule. You can explain it right away in 25. <laughs> <laughs> but then it has the other problem where there's no, yeah, there's no plot at all. It's just locations. It's just locations. And Seth has our final questions. Have you been to the Grand Canyon? No, and I want to go so much. It's 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 oh. definitely like... Hopefully it'll be one of the Una teenage trips. There's only a few states I haven't been to. I've been to like 47, 47 of the 50 states. What are the three? Give us the three. Hawaii is is the really glaring one. Yeah. And I think Mississippi is one of them. And I don't I can't think of the third, but but I've pretty much been everywhere. I mean, I'm going in, in 2024 in the police stop the ride tour, I'm going to 44 cities. Look at you. Wow. That's amazing. It's wild. Busy boy. Now I guess I shouldn't be surprised that you want to go to the Grand Canyon because you famously love adventure. Oh, I love adventure. Everyone knows this about me. <laughs> everyone except everyone I know knows this about me. I think that's a good way of looking at it. You've said it in a way that makes sense to me, which is teenage years, kids to the Grand Canyon, when they can they can stay on their own two feet. There's no risk. Yes. They have balance. I think balance is key. Look, Seth, I'm looking to go to the Grand Canyon and take a closet and turn it into a little home. <laughs> Do they have that there? They might. On the side of the cliffs, you might be able to find a small little burrow <laughs> hole. Rock nooks. Yeah. yeah. And I, I and I want to have just a big house party where there's cars parked up Beaver Drive and down Westwood Road. And it's just like tire tracks everywhere. And at the end of the whole thing, an oak tree comes down on, on my car. People, you want people parallel parking on the rim of the Grand Canyon for your park. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, it is just a delight to talk to you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. This this was great. Yeah. All right. I'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. One winter time. Mike's dad said we are going to be a skiing family. Couldn't get that rack up on the car. Didn't look like they were getting far. But his brother figured it out. Bunch of chords And to Vermont They did go To the Von Trapp Lodge Up in store And Mike was young Just a little squirt If he was a Von Trapp He'd def be Kurt And the craziest thing happened When they were driving at home And if you don't believe them Just check the bulletin go They saw That's right.